We turn in the scriptures to the last chapter of Paul's letter to the Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter thirteen. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time. And being absent, now I write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which is to you word, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? But I trust that ye shall know that, I, that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Not that we sh would have, should appear approved, but that we should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are weak when we are weak, for we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, and not to destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. The reason for the selection of this passage of Scripture in relation to Lord's Day 20 or 30 is found in the fifth verse, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Lord's Day 30 is the last of the three Lord's Days that are committed to the explanation of the Lord's Supper. And the focus of them is on the fact that the whole of the activity of faith is that of faith. It's a spiritual activity. And so we're going to take as our three points the spiritual presence of Christ, the spiritual administration of Christ, and the spiritual partaking. So it's, the word spiritual is emphasized. And that's going to be seen in these question and answers too. Lord's Day 30, question and answer 80. What difference is there between the Lord's Supper and the Popish Mass? First, the positive. The Lord's Supper testifies to us that we have a full pardon of all sin by the only sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which he himself has once accomplished on the cross. And that we by the Holy Ghost are engrafted into Christ, who according to his human nature is now not on earth, but in heaven at the right hand of God his Father, 
and will there be worshipped by us. But the Mass teaches that the living and the dead have not the pardon of sins through the sufferings of Christ, unless Christ is also daily offered for them by the priests. And the idea is that that sacrifice by the priest covers all the sins committed to that point. So that's why their statement, the Mass teaches that the living and the dead have not the pardon of sins through the sufferings of Christ. What he did, unless Christ is daily offered, that's, got, they've got to be covered. Every day we've got to have them covered. Daily offered for them by the priests. Further, that Christ is bodily under the form of bread and wine and therefore is to be worshipped in them. So that the Mass at bottom is nothing else than a denial of the one sacrifice and sufferings of Jesus Christ and an accursed idolatry. For whom is the Lord's Supper instituted? For those who are truly sorrowful for their sins, and yet trust that these are forgiven them for the sake of Christ, and that their remaining infirmities are covered by his passion and death, and who also earnestly desire to have their faith more and more strengthened, and their lives more holy. But hypocrites... And such as turn not to God with sincere hearts, eat and drink judgment to themselves. Are they also to be admitted to this supper who by confession and life declare themselves unbelieving and ungodly? And while we're going to make that clear, hopefully later on in the course of the sermon, notice that you've got three groups. You've got hypocrites, that's at the end of 81, and then those who do not turn to him with sincere hearts. That's the second group. Now you've got a third group. Those who by confession and life declare themselves unbelieving and ungodly. So these are people who are not members of the church. No, for by this the covenant of God would be profaned and his wrath kindled against the whole congregation. Therefore, it is the duty of the Christian church, according to the appointment of Christ and his apostles, to exclude such persons by the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Till, always hope, till they show amendment of life. The church at Corinth the first letter, chapter 11, shows that they struggled to always see the sacrament correctly. Often they would come together and use it as a regular meal instead of as an opportunity to see what Christ has done for them. So, it needed to be corrected. So the church at Corinth historically struggled to commemorate the death of Christ in the sacrament correctly. What we want to see is what we believe the scriptures and the confessions based on the scriptures emphasize, and that is the word spiritual. Christ is not physically present, he's spiritually present. The way in which the sacrament is to be administered is to emphasize there's a spiritual part, and then the partaking is to be spiritual. So we don't take partake of it just because we put it in our mouth and chew it and swallow it. That's not proper partaking. There has to be something inside. There has to be sincerity. So now... That's what we want to see, and we pray that the Lord, through the preaching, will communicate that to us. The Reformed position, as it's, as it's explained in the first part of question and answer 80, 
emphasizes that Christ is present spiritually. Rome, Rome and the Lutherans both took the position that Jesus was somehow represented physically. Rome's, the word that is used by Rome and others to describe their position is transubstantiation. The Lutheran position is called consubstantiation. Now, that's not just big words, but they're easily understood. The last part, substance, substance. Trans means to change over, go across. Rome's position is that bread is changed over. The substance of bread is changed over into the very body of Jesus. The wine is, the substance of the wine is changed over so that it's actually the blood of Jesus. It really is. That's why when they come into their buildings for worship, before they go into their aisles, they bow. Not to the crucifix that they often have, but to the table, wherever it is. They're bowing to the table because they're going to genuflect to Jesus. They're going to worship him as he's present in that bread and that wine. No, I, his body and blood are very really there. So every time the priest takes a bread and he breaks it, he's crucifying. Every time he pours, he's, Jesus is shedding his blood again. He has to be crucified over and over to cover all the sins that have been committed unto that, until that point. Luther, when he met with the Reformed, then he struggled. And we've been told, whether it's true or not, but we've been told that they met around a table and there was some dust in the table. And Luther, with his finger, wrote in the dust in Latin, the words that Jesus said, this is my body. Luther did not want to say what Rome said. But he wasn't ready to say it just represents as the Reformed say. So Luther took a, a position that was a sort of a compromise. And he held to the, and, and, and Lutherans are supposed to, in their creeds, they do still hold to this position. Con, substance, with the substance. Jesus' human nature is everywhere. That, that, that's another fancy word. The ubiquity of the human nature of Jesus. Ubiquitous. It's everywhere present. So, Jesus, because he's everywhere present, is with, con, substance, is with that bread and with that wine. So, Luther had Jesus everywhere present, physically, everywhere present, his human nature, also in the bread and wine. The Reformed position that we believe is biblical is that Christ's presence is there. The Zwinglians went way to the other extreme and said he's not there at all. But the reform position is Christ's presence is there spiritually. It's only by faith. Not really. Nothing's changed. And they denied the position Luther had to take if he wanted Jesus to be with the bread and wine, namely that Jesus' human nature is everywhere. That's why the Reformed in this question answer of 80 is his human nature is only in one place at one time. 
Jesus' human nature did not become omnipresent. That's Luther. So Jesus gained his human nature in the womb of Mary. His human nature was united with his divine on earth in a weakened human nature. He didn't lose that human nature. He still has that same human nature. But now that human nature is heavenly and exalted. But it's still only in one place. At any given time. It's in heaven. Not here. Not with. His spirit is with us, but not his human nature. That's the difference between the two positions. I don't know if you all remember, right after the prayer in the form, the Father's maintaining the same position as the Heidelberg Catechism, say this, and you're going to all recognize this with familiarity, but now you're going to, I hopefully, understand it better. So, we just made the confession of faith in the prayer. Amen. We all open our eyes. Some of you still have your books open. Most of you don't. And this is what's said. That we may now be fed with the true heavenly bread, Christ Jesus, that we may be fed with Christ. He's the heavenly bread. Let us not cleave with our hearts unto the external bread and wine. Here it is. But lift our hearts up on high in heaven where Christ Jesus sits at the right hand of our advocate, at the right hand of his... He's there, at the right hand of our Heavenly Father, whither all the articles of our faith lead us. Not here. He's there. And therefore, this conclusion. Let's not doubt, but we shall certainly be fed and refreshed in our souls through the working of the Holy Spirit, spiritual presence. Holy Spirit, with His body and blood, as we receive, then, very striking, they add the adjective holy. This holy bread and wine, remembering in remembrance of Him. It's holy only because we've separated it now from common use. Now, we may say, as we partake of it, it's not bakery bread or Meyer bread. It's separated from that as we're going to use it for a holy purpose. It's different as we partake of it. Now, immediately afterwards, it's bread. The people who cut it up can take it home and eat it bread but during the administration of the sacrament it's separated from common use we're not looking at it as bread when we take it and chew it we're not thinking about common bread we're thinking about Christ Jesus the true heavenly bread and he becomes a part of us and we're engrafted into him and he into us that's the idea the spiritual presence of Christ. So when Jesus said that statement that Luther wrote in Latin in the dust on the table, this is my body, this is my blood, the Reformed position is when Jesus said, I am the door, he wasn't saying he's literally the door. He's talking about What a door represents that I am. This represents the body. This represents the blood. Only to those with faith. Or better yet, only to those who are exercising faith can they see the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. The elements are pictures of that body and blood. 
And in that way, we show, we demonstrate the death of our Savior. We demonstrate the way to salvation is in the death of God's Son. The way to be saved is Jesus must die. So, a spiritual presence of Christ. Spiritually administered. Three things that we want to point out there. You are, with your physical eyes, going to see a minister stand there. And you're going to see the elders at the end of the rows passing the elements. Faith doesn't see a man, but faith hears Jesus. This is the body of Christ. Broken for you. Take and eat. Jesus' words, take and eat, and do so in remembrance of me. We're going to hear the Lord Jesus himself. And it's to that end that, this is an oversimplification, so it's got weaknesses, but it's to that end that catechism classes take place under the supervision of the elders so that the children, young people, are able to have this understanding of the Lord's Supper. They're learning that it's a spiritual presence and that it is going to be administered as by the Lord Jesus himself. It's his table. Second, the main reason that we don't take as elders the Lord's Supper to Clark Nursing Home for Mrs. Birch. And we didn't take it to the various homes that the Van Manens were in when they could not attend or when she couldn't come but she was in her house. We didn't take the, the sacrament, the elements to her home because, again, spiritual administration requires the preaching. The preaching of Christ crucified. Now recall everything that you've heard and know from the scriptures about how preaching differs from all lecturing, all other means of teaching. And the heart of that is that God in 1 Corinthians 1 and in Romans 10 makes it clear that it is his will that he chooses the weak and the base things of the world to confound the wise who want to say, well, there's a better way to teach. God is pleased to have the gospel of a Christ crucified and the preaching of Christ crucified to be of him the wisdom and of him the power. He makes preaching have a power. Nothing else has. But preaching is most emphatically a spiritual work. So when the sacraments administered, what kind of a Jesus died? What kind of a death did Jesus experience. The preaching of a text from the Word of God explains and demonstrates the Christ so that you, when the sacrament is being administered, you are remembering what you heard in the preaching about the Christ. You're taught about the Savior. And that's what your mind is to see when it's administered and you actually partake of it. And that preaching will show to you 
that what Jesus did is everything. Maybe some passages of scripture that I should have noted earlier, but I would like to take the time to show that what Jesus did in his death was once for all. There's a verse in Romans 6 that sometimes, because it's not the key point of Romans 6, you kind of slip over. But verse 10, he's, now he's going to say that first admonition of the whole of the book of Romans in verse 11. Reckon yourselves to be indeed dead to sin and alive to God. Verse 10, just before it, in that he died, he died unto sin once, not repeatedly crucified. He died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Verse 9 explains that, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, because he died once. Now, a couple of verses out of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 9, verse 12, is the first. 9, verse 12. Not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal. In the catechism. That second answer. We trust that our sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ. Now listen to this next phrase. And that their remaining infirmities are covered by his passion and death. Not only my sins, but my sinfulness. And we can say that that remaining infirmities, everything I'm going to commit wrong in the future. That's the boldness with which the Reformed faith is ready to point out the nature of the death of Christ. He hath obtained eternal redemption. What he did 2,000 years ago covers what we're, we have done and what we're going to do. Take a look also at verse 28 of that passage. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Again, the word once offered. Chapter 10, verse 10 of Hebrews. By the which will we be will by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. Preaching proclaims that kind of a Christ. Spiritual administration. Third about spiritual administration is this. It is the duty of the elders to make sure that the table is guarded. By that phrase, guarded, we have an explanation for why the administration of the sacrament is not open. Anybody who happens to be in that day at that time, it's up to you. you it's all yours. Nor closed. Only, only a few or only those who are in good standing. But rather, the guarding is to determine and to explain that we're close, spiritually close together in what we believe and in how we are to live our faith. In faith and life, we're close together. Now, think of when Jesus administered the sacrament. In order to gain an understanding, why, we might say, must the table be guarded so that the elders will determine who comes and who doesn't come. Well, it's because the host, at the very first administration of the sacrament, 
determined who was going to be there. Did Jesus, at a feast time, administer the sacrament to everybody? Did he do it on the street? No. He did it in the upper room. Who was there? Not the one that he knew would betray him. But the other eleven those in whom he knew faith existed. Weakness, sin. They showed their sinfulness by not wanting to wash anybody's feet. But he knew they believed him to be the Son of God. That's why the administration or the, the institution of the sacrament of Lord's Supper was at the very end of the whole Passover feast. Sure, Judas Iscariot was there at the beginning. But it was in the middle of it that Jesus dismissed him. And then after that, as he got to the end of the fast, Passover feast, the 13th of the 15 steps, that's when he instituted the sacrament. So the sacrament does not have the, the point of the preaching. The preaching is a call. It's a call to all who attend. It's not grace to all who attend, but it is a call to all who attend. A gospel call to the converted and to the unconverted. To be converted or converted anew. But the sacrament doesn't do that. The sacrament has another emphasis. So the elders, by their constant supervision, have a determination of who's in good standing. They don't have to go over it list by list, week by week, month by month, but there are members in good standing. They have the right to have baptism administered to their child. They have the right to come to the table of the Lord. If there's a visitor, then there's a distinction. And the distinction is there's a privilege that we recognize in those who come from churches that are federated with us. Because in the federation, we know what every church is going to say, this is what we believe and this is how we are to live. So even if we don't know the people, when by their testimony they're in good standing, the elders will say, you're a member in good standing in that church? Well, we know what they preach and teach and what they demand of how you are to live. You are welcome to come and partake with us. If you're from a different denomination, then, well, we're not sure what you believe and how you live. We know what those federated with us do, but we need to talk with you. Now, we don't automatically say, no, we'll welcome you to come. But we need the time to be able to come out here and assure everybody we're close. We're close. We want you to know that when we allow someone else to partake from a different denomination, they are close with you in faith and life so that this unity, we partake together. Something that in this past week, those who visited with the ministers and the elder from Namibia and South Africa, You've read in previous articles of the Standard Bearer how they believe in a common cup. and They believe you've got to come to the table. Their concept of the fact we are one. We're one together. We partake at the, not just at the same time, we partake together and show the unity of the body of Christ. They emphasize that so much that they think just the common cup is wrong or not good. That's the emphasis that is present. We partake together at the same time, indicating this is the way we show our love 
for one another. We're close in that sense as well. So, spiritual presence, spiritual administration, spiritual activity of faith makes one a proper partaker. Now, in the course of the explanation, there's been a dedicated effort to use the word sincere. That comes from the very last part of the 81st answer. Turn to God with a sincere heart. Listen for the word sincere. The idea of it, it's genuine, it's real, and it's being seriously exercised. That's sincere. Proper receiving and eating or drinking of the elements requires a soul that has seriously considered his own sin. That has seriously considered that that sin is a violation of the will of my Father. And so godly sorrow, sincere godly sorrow, that sincere sinner trusts, believes in and trusts that the death of the Son of God was necessary and it once for all accomplished forgiveness of all of my sins. I am fully covered. We grasp that sincerely. And there's a sincere, the presence of a sincere desire to appreciate Him more and to grow in my faith in Him and to live more and more godly as an expression of my gratitude. Sincere is not determining, well, you better hit this level. And if you're sincere but you're not up to here, no. The younger ones among us can have a sincerity to believe I'm a sinner. I violated the will of God and my Father in heaven. Christ died and he earned forgiveness and I want to thank him. But the level of, this, of, the, of the appreciation of those truths in a mature child of God is going to be different than that of a teenager. But there's all degrees in between. And you know what? Sometimes the mature believer at that moment isn't with it. He's disturbed. He's got other thoughts. He's easily distracted that Sunday. And his level of sincerity isn't where it ought to be. He's not sincere. But sincerity is something that you must judge for yourself. Are we sincere? Am I sincere? That's the key word. Do I seriously consider my sin, my sorrow, my conviction that, that brought about the death of, my, of God's Son and that death fully paid and now I want to do better. I want to grow. I want to have more and more stronger faith, and more and more holy life. Okay, that's sincerity. That's why there are partakers of three kinds, improper partakers of three kinds, 
improper partakers. You can have the improper partaker that's described in question 82. They show in their life they're not a believer at all. You can have a hypocrite. Now, a hypocrite is not someone who's hypocritical. Well, a hypocrite is somebody who's hypocritical all the time. But a hypocrite is somebody who's a member of the church and they know in their heart that they're not a believer. That's a hypocrite. A child of God can at times be hypocritical, just as a wise builder who's building his house on the rock can have moments of folly. But he doesn't make him a fool. A hypocrite knows he's not a believer, but he acts like he is. So one, the one of 82, question who by confession and life show their unbelieving and ungodly. There's a hypocrite. He shows he's believing and godly, but he isn't really inside. And then our Father has said, there's also those who turn to God without a sincere heart. Well, that's a believer who on that day doesn't come to church. Well, that's what he does. He goes to church. But he doesn't worship. He eats. Boy, this bread is stale. Wish the wine was cold. His head is everywhere, but not on the death of the Son of God. Then sincerity has gone. Insincere. God wants us to come sincerely. When we sincerely partake by faith, then blessings result. The supper gives us an assurance. As we taste that bread and feel that wine go down, we have an assurance. The Lord Jesus Christ is a part of me. I don't just look at him, I take in obedience. And he's a part of me. I'm assured that he has forgiven me. But I'm stimulated, just like food stimulates us, to greater desire to know him, to love him, to experience the reality of his life, that he loves us and gave himself for us. And it's through that experience that then we not only taste his blessings, but our union with each other. That's why those with anger, those with carrying grudges against fellow members, are to leave their gift before they come. They've got to fix it before they come to the table. Come sincerely see a spiritual Jesus see him see the administration to be spiritual needs the preaching of that Christ and then partake spiritually sincerely and then we walk out renewed again this sinner, this one who only sins and always sins, is gifted with the amazing grace to be forgiven and to be righteous. Praise the Lord. Amen. We thank Thee, Father, for this word. We thank Thee for the truth that we are to examine ourselves to see whether we have faith. We may know that, that that examination as it takes place over the course of our life, we have the past to assure us about the present. We are grateful. Give thy blessing to us, Father. We thank thee for the sacrament. 
We thank Thee for the picture that's given and drawn for us. May we not focus on the picture, but on Thee and on the Savior and what He's done for us. For Jesus' sake, amen.